Okay, we're good. I apologize. Last week we had some problems. This week we think we got it fixed. So people who will be speaking and singing into mics are going to get a little closer to their mic to make sure that they're heard. So thank you for telling us uh, when you can't hear. Uh, it's great if you can tell us during the service somehow so we can fix it right then. But we heard last week, so this week we, will ble we believe will be better. So before we got started this morning, I went to Google and I asked this question, what are the benefits of cold air? <laughs> and here are the things that it said. Cooler temps boost your brain. That's good. It might help you burn calories. Um, it improves allergies. It, winter can lower inflammations. It can lower the risk of diseases. We're kind of you know, not so sure about that one right now. You can sleep better, and it supposedly helps fight infection. So, and that leads me to my scripture for this morning. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So even though it's cooler, uh, God can use even this temperature change as we worship together. I just said to somebody this morning, it reminds me of sunrise service on Easter. So I'm, I'm glad, glad that you are here today to so worship the Lord in the beauty of creation on this sunny day, a little cool, but it'll warm up. And as we worship God, hopefully our spirits as well will warm up, knowing that God works everything for good in our lives as we're called for Him. Let's uh, prepare ourselves for worship as we listen to our prelude, Grace Medley. Thank you. 
please stand together as we come for the worship. Up on the mountain where your love captured me, where finally I'm free, this I know. Up on the mountain where you taught my soul to sing, amazing grace, the sweetest thing, this I know. And then the storm rushes in, here I am again, this I know. Pick me up where I was, and I never wanted more than you. Lift me up, feel your touch. It wouldn't be that much for you. This I know. Put life back in these bones, this I know. Pick me up where I was, and I never wanted more than you. Lift me up, feel your touch, it wouldn't be that much for you, this I Great 
is our God. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, then all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great desire as your people that all the world would know your greatness, the greatness of your love, the depth of your grace, the expanse of your mercy. We give you praise for this day, for your presence with us. We give you praise that we can be in your house, as it were, in this place to honor you with our worship. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirit to everything 
you have for us that will draw us closer in our walk with you. Use this day for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let's take some time to turn to those near us and welcome them here with the peace of Christ. The peace of the Lord be with you. Good morning and a very special welcome to all the families with children who are joining us this morning. We are very happy to have you. Um, we do have a children's bulletin to help to engage your preschool or an elementary student in our worship service today. Um, they can be found in a bin over there by that welcome table. So for our students out there, have you ever wondered if God is grading you? Maybe he's keeping some kind of score chart or making a list and checking it twice to find out if you've been naughty or nice. How do you think you're doing? Do you have an A? Are you leading? If you're not sure where you fall on God's list, I want you to listen closely to our scripture and message today as we talk about grace. We aren't talking about a girl's name the prayer we say before a meal, or the ability to move beautifully. Grace is loving someone even when they don't deserve it. And what does that look like? Well, for my daughter Michaela, it looks like a week where she doesn't empty the dishwasher, vacuum, or put her dirty clothes in the hamper, then comes to me and her dad and asks for her allowance. And we gladly and lovingly hand it over to her without complaint. She didn't earn her allowance, but we freely gave it to her out of love. So as we go through the service, I want you to try and figure out what God's grace means. Write it down in your bulletin. We will talk about it after service, or if you're not with us after service, you can talk about it with your parents all week long. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the kids who have joined us this morning. We pray that um, they will hear the message of your grace and that they will live out their faith, not just on Sundays, but every day of the week at school, at home, or on the soccer field, wherever they may be, God, just be with them, bless them, and help them to live their faith. We ask this in your son Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Uh, this morning, once again, for your faithful stewardship and for your generosity to the work of the Lord through First United Methodist Church. Uh, thank you to those who continue to support the virtual learning that's happening in our building to help students in the Chambersburg School District have access to the internet. We're up to 50 kids now. Um, so um, those students who otherwise would be falling behind now have the opportunity with some adult supervision and the internet access to keep up and to engage in their, their classes online. So thank you for helping to make that happen for them. The other announcements that are in the bulletin, I hope that you'll take the opportunity to read those, <coughs> to read also the announcements that came to you if you get the e-blast uh, on Friday. The one thing I want to highlight today is that uh, Reverend Kathy Boylou's installation as the York District Superintendent will take place at 4 o'clock this afternoon. There are links that are listed here in the bulletin. Those links were also in the e-blast. So I hope that you'll be able to um, uh, log in and to watch uh, and be part of uh, Pastor Kathy's installation as our new district superintendent. I want to welcome any visitors, as, um, as Brianna has already done, we'll welcome visitors with us today. Glad that you're here. And you'll find at the desk a gift for you this morning, to our way of saying thank you 
for joining us here uh, today. If you uh, want to make a contribution and continue in your tithes and offerings through uh, First Church, there's a number of ways for you to do that. There are offering buckets at the tables. You can drop your offering in there as you leave today. You can go online to our website, which is firstonsecond.org, and you can click on the word give in the upper right-hand corner and follow the instructions, and you can give online. Or you can mail your gift to the church at uh, First UM Church, or 225 South 2nd Street, Chambersburg, PA 17201. I'm still learning that address. I'm still getting that memorized. Let's come to God in prayer. Lord, we're thankful that we can be out in this place today uh, to worship you, to be in fellowship with each other, to sense your presence, and to learn about what grace means in our life today. Lord, help us um, this morning to, to lift up to you the concerns that we carry in our own hearts to you in prayer. That during this moment in our service, that the burdens that maybe that we've borne through the week, we can lay down now before you and know that you care and that you work and that you change circumstances by the movement of your spirit in response to our prayers. We ask, Lord, for those who are friends, who are struggling, those who have illness. We pray, Father, for those with whom we work. We pray, Father, for students in our schools and our teachers. We pray for those, Lord, who um, are a part of essential services like our police force, our fire department, and our EMTs, those that staff the hospital. So many people that uh, give of themselves to, um, to make our community a wonderful place for those that work in grocery stores and retail to provide what we need. Lord, we thank you for all the people that make a community a community. And we thank you, Lord, that we can be part of that community as your church uh, and, and to lift up other people through our service in your name. And Lord, we know that all of that's because of your grace in our life because you've loved us first and that you've changed us, you've transformed us by the work of your spirit in our lives. Lord, help us to identify that to other people by the way we live. Help other people to identify within us your grace, your love, your mercy as we share all of that with people. We thank you, Lord, today for uh, the opportunity to, to worship, to sing, to pray, um, to listen to your word, to reflect upon it, uh, and afterwards to engage in conversations and, and to grow in our own spiritual lives as we, as we talk together about your word. Bless us this day. We pray especially this afternoon for Pastor Kathy as she's installed as our district superintendent. We ask your blessing on her and Mike and her family and all those who are part of the York District. Lord, make uh, this afternoon be a blessed time. Uh, during her installation. May you receive glory. And now, Lord, we pray you continue to lead us in this time of worship. For we ask all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, let's listen now as Mark Davis comes to read our morning scripture. I've got to say this is a God moment for me because last night my wife said, let's go do something. And she said, let's go to the Marion Fest to celebrate Marion Days because we know one of the musicians that was playing uh, there. And there was a free movie afterwards, and it was the movie Overcomer. And the story of that movie is based on the, ver uh, the two first chapters of Ephesians about 
grace and ask the question who you are. You know, I could say that I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a man, I'm self employed, but who are you really? And it comes down to being a child of God. So the scripture lesson is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of us, the rest of the world obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things he planned for us long ago. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. It's 
So, a clergyman is walking down the street. Don't you love it when a sermon starts with that? A clergyman was walking down the street when he came upon a group of about a dozen boys, all of them between 10 and 12 years old, and the group had surrounded a dog and concerned lest the boys you know, were hurting the dog. He went over and he asked, what are you doing with that dog? And one of the boys replied, this dog is just an old neighborhood stray. We all want him, but only one of us can take him home. So we've decided that whichever one of us can tell the biggest lie will get to keep the dog. So, of course, the reverend was taken aback by that, and he said, you boys shouldn't be having a contest telling lies. And then he launched into a 10-minute sermon, as we are wont to do sometimes, against lying. And he began by saying, don't you boys know it's a sin to lie? And he ended with, why, when I was your age, I never told a lie. And there was dead silence for a minute, and just, the, just as the reverend was beginning to think he'd gotten through to them, the smallest boy gave a deep sigh and said, all right, give him the dog. <laughs> we are living in a time when increasingly people don't seem to know the difference between the truth and the lie. Alexander Solzhenitsyn once said, if I were called upon to identify the principal trait of the 20th century, I would be unable to find anything more precise and pithy than this statement. People have forgotten God. I think that's true. People don't know what sin is because they've forgotten God. And therefore, they don't know what grace is either. Can you all hear that? Can, if you can hear that, say amen. Amen. Okay, the people in the back, were you saying amen? Okay, great. But when people do remember God, for whatever reason, whether it's guilt or tragedy or a death or an illness or just getting older, they often think that, as they're thinking about God now, that living by rules is the way to get into God's favor. Brianna kind of tickled that idea with the children about God keeping a list of who's naughty and who's nice, and we kind of fall into that. And that's why religion can really be detrimental in some aspect to people because it can end up being just about rules and regulations. No matter how hard we try, we just can't seem to get past this idea of needing to live by law rather than grace. The book of Galatians is all about that. <clears throat> that Christians who came to know Jesus by grace somehow when it were being lured back into living by law instead. <clears throat> and, and we just kind of feel like that's got to be the only way we're going to improve. If we just buckle down and try really hard and punish ourselves when we do badly, and reward ourselves when we do well, that we will change. Um, there was an article a number of years ago in the Wall Street Journal that was looking at the way that people were using the internet and mobile phones and apps to uh, regulate their lives. And that these and there are increasing numbers of apps that would cajole, pressure, threaten, judge, nag us, about what we're supposed to do and punish us when we fall short. So, uh, for instance, there's, the, there's this one app called Happy, H-A-P-I. It's a happy fork. It's a fork that measures how fast you're eating, and it prods you to slow down and to chew. It's true. There is such a thing. There's a company called Automatic that offers a device that will chirp when a driver speeds or slams on the brakes or does any other thing behind the wheel that your mother wouldn't like. Um, for $50, you can get a 
brush, a toothbrush, that will um, send wirelessly uh, to your uh, smartphone uh, how often and how long you brush your teeth. And then it'll send you a reward or to give you some kind of a remedial thing to do if your behavior, br if your toothbrushing behavior needs improving. And there's, a, there's also a, a webcam software program called Posture Track that will catch you if you're slouching. And, and a website called Be Minder that will tally fines for undesirable behavior like not flossing or staying up too late. I mean, so we just, we're looking for things that are trying to make our life better and in the process we're becoming encumbered by lots of rules and regulations when we fall into those kind of apps and that they can kind of run your life. And in a sense, this is sort of what Paul is talking about in our, uh, our humanity or by our human nature apart from God. Our, our state of being is such that rules and regulations won't get us out of it. He says that our state is so helpless that he uses uh, three different words to describe our state. And the first one that's the most, uh, the one that might take you back the most is that we're dead. You are dead because of your disobedience. He says to the Ephesians, once you were dead because of your disobedience. You know, and so, and I, I can't, I didn't watch this program because it just creeps me out, but the, the Walking Dead program, you know, literally there are people who are, they're dead, but they're walking and and, uh, and, and that's sort of an apt description of our life outside of Christ. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, Paul says. While we were, you know, that, that we had no life in us spiritually outside of Christ. One uh, preaching professor, uh, Erwin Lutzer, used to take his class to a cemetery. And he would... To try to make this point, he would point out a name on a tombstone and he would tell one of his students, preach to Mr. Smith. And they all look like him, look at him like he lost his mind. Uh, and he'd, so he said, I'd start to preach to Mr. Smith with as much enthusiasm as I could. And I would begin by saying, sir, Jesus died for your sins and you must put your faith in him. And he's preaching to the tombstone. And then he'd look at the students and trying to drive home this point to them, he would say, there's no difference in preaching the gospel to unsaved people, to people who have no spiritual interest or life. But the Bible says that they're dead in their sins. And here's the passage that we're reading. And you can preach your heart out, but nothing will happen unless God does a miracle in giving them life. And that miracle is the work of the Holy Spirit in every person to open up their heart. Um, you know, we, we need God's help to hear. If you take a CPR class, the, you'll be taught procedures of what you need to do if someone stops breathing. And you have to do certain things to hopefully get them breathing again. You don't just sit there and yell at them to breathe. You can't just shout them into breathing. Um, they they can't. They're unable at that moment to hear your shouts anyway. You have to breathe for them to get them started. And that's what God does with spiritually dead people. He breathes in them with the work of his Holy Spirit so they're unable to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. That's how far we are, how far we're gone outside of God's help. He needs to to touch us with his spirit to get us to respond to what he wants us so much to know. Our condition and our separation from God is just that. We need God to do something for us because we're dead. And the wonderful thing is God does all the time. All the time. God loves people who have no thought for him at all and continues to touch them and woo them, sending his spirit to touch to help them to respond. Wesley called this prevenient grace. That's your Methodist term for today. Prevenient grace, meaning it's out there 
for everybody. If you think of our life as a spiritual house, provenient grace is the porch. It's where you stand. It's where God brings us up before we go through the door, which is justification, to enter the house, which is sanctification. But we're on the porch, standing there. God brings us there by his spirit, by his prevening grace, to woo us to himself so that we can believe and be saved. But unless the spirit does that, we're, as Wesley said, we're, you know, and reflecting Paul and every other Christian theologian with their salt, we're dead in our sins. And then the second idea that, that uh, Paul uses to describe our condition outside of God's uh, outside of life with God is enslavement. So he says in verse 2, you used to live in sin just like the rest of us, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to believe God. You know, there are there is a spiritual force that works really hard to keep you from following in a life of grace from receiving the the mercy and love of God and and Paul calls him out here the devil and you can read in the gospel stories Jesus encounters with the devil and how did Jesus respond in his temptation to the devil he responded by God's word and by trusting in his heavenly father our First captivity is to a system that's run by the spiritual force that, that has systematized the world, that permeates everything around us, and so often has a dehumanizing effect. You look at world history, and you look at the ways that humanity has tried to organize itself or to run its government. You look at communism and socialism, and even sometimes... You know, you think about capitalism, which can be good, but can turn to evil, too. Every kind of system that people can think of can turn to ill effect, to evil effect. People submit to its influence in pop culture and in social media influence in every area of life. And God isn't honored in the systems of this world. I mean, if you, you know, God isn't lifted up as one worthy of your allegiance in most of what the, the world systematized. And it, it's a system run by the force of evil that just pulls people down. Now, I'm not saying that that means we can't watch TV or that we can't listen to music or anything like that. That's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about um, a, a system that tries to tell us that we are our own best source of help, that we are a in, in some ways, kind of gods unto ourselves in the way that humanity gets painted, that we have the solution for everything. But really, people, what people need is, uh, is to be freed, set free from enslavement. If, you have, if you've seen the movie Schindler's List, you know, it's a, it's a story about a man named Oscar Schindler who during World War II, he was a, he was a German hustler, but also a he hero. He used his uh, position uh, as a factory manager to employ um, uh, 1,200 Polish Jews. And he used his wits and connections to save the lives of those 1,200 Polish Jews. And uh, he was honored in Israel as a righteous Gentile. The unfortunate story that happens after Schindler's List is that um, this noble man abandoned his wife and became a womanizer and he became addicted to alcohol and he fell into destitution and dependence on others and even pawned the gold ring um, that had been given to him by uh, the Jews that he had liberated, made from their gold fillings of their, of their um, false teeth. So you think about the story of a man who was so honored and yet and did, was portrayed as doing such a noble thing and, and yet got caught up in a system of you know, womanizing and, and alcohol addiction that it just ruined his life. And that's... We can't sit in judgment on someone like Oscar Schindler because 
What's, what's the phrase we say? There but for the grace of God go I. Every human heart, every human person is subject to temptation and resonance in every human heart. The, and so we have to be aware of what's, you know, what we're up against without God. And we might, we might try to save ourselves, but, you know, science, can't, education can't save us. Uh, morality can't save us. Uh, we need something outside of ourselves. To sa- Our stuff won't save us. Advertising tries to make us think that all we need to have a really wonderful life is just to purchase this or purchase that. That's not going to save us. Science, space, astronomy isn't going to save us. What do we need for our salvation? Nothing that we find that we will find in ourselves. There's nothing about you or me that's sufficient to, 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 to save us from the situation in which we find ourselves. Since these things don't offer a cure to our, the death of our soul or the enslavement to our, of our nature by what we live under, it just leaves us with this third thing of condemnation. You know, um, where it says, by our very nature in verse 3, we were subject to God's anger. If you read what Paul says there, it's a sense of condemnation that we're all kind of like in a, in a, in a situation where we realize we really aren't, we're deserving of God's anger or wrath. Augustine of Hippo, in his confessions, said about his incurable sin, he said, my sin was all the more incurable because I did not think myself a sinner. And a lot of people don't think of themselves that way. I did a, I did a pre-marriage counseling with a couple years ago. And I was trying to explain the gospel um, to them. And the young man said, I am the most righteous person I know. Wow, I did not exactly know how to respond to that. But I think in some ways, a lot of people think that. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm not a sinner. We don't know that in our natural state that we are separated from God and steeped in sin. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, again, to quote him once more, said that if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us, And destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? Paul says that everyone is deserving of God's wrath. In the book of Romans, we read that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, God's wrath is not like our wrath, our anger. God's anger is not like our anger. Our anger is more akin to a bad temper. Our anger is more akin to us not getting our own way. But God's anger is not spite. God's anger is not retribution. God's anger is God's personal righteous and constant hostility to evil, his refusal to compromise with it, and his resolve to condemn evil for the damage it does to his creation. And so God's wrath is not incompatible with his love. I hear people all say all the time, oh, God, this God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath. This God of the Old Testament is a God of love. And in his anger, he was justified because it was always against evil that perpetrated it itself against those who he had created and all the rest of creation. So all I've talked about so far this morning, if I made you depressed are these first three verses. These first three verses where Paul talked about our human condition. And he he sets us up to see what our real need is. These first three verses of this section just gives us a picture of a a reality. You know, and every, you know, one of the great things about our phones when we take pictures is I can go through there and I go, I can delete the pictures that I, where I might not look very good. Or it's my bad side, or my eyes are squinty. I can just get, and so I can I can try to get the best looking picture of me, which is takes you know there's not many not that I take pictures of myself all the time. Boy, I'm really digging a hole here. Um, that but you we think that we can judge ourselves, 
we can see our flaws and we can, uh, you know, correct ourselves, but we can't. The first three verses show us exactly what we look like with all of our flaws, deeply ingrained. And if we were to stop right there, we could be depressed, except for this three-letter word, but. So Paul tells us what our condition is, and then he says in the beginning of verse 4, but. And that changes everything. But God is so rich in mercy and loved us so much. We're walking dead, but God is rich in mercy and loves us so much. And so then God shifts from this looking at humanity and our fallenness, our, our dead state, and he shifts over to look at grace, what God has done for us. <clears throat> He's made us alive in Christ. He's raised us up with Christ. He's made us sit with Christ in heaven. It's a wonderful thing. It changes everything. When you live in grace and you let go of the rules and the regulations and start to have a relationship with God that's not based on that stuff, not trying to win God's approval, but accepting the fact that God approves of you, your flaws and everything, and loves you in spite of all those things, is a whole different way to live. To live by grace is eons distant from living by rules and regulations. It is freeing to the human spirit and liberating to the human soul. The college admission process can be a very stressful experience for high school students. There are two guys, Wayne and Dave. <clears throat> they applied for early admission to the same college. That December, Wayne is accepted and Dwayne or Dave is deferred. So Wayne's accepted, Dave's deferred. And the next four months during which Dave waited for the final ruling looked very different and yet very similar to Wayne's. They both took basically the same classes and had the same work, homework load. They spent time with many of the same people socially, but there was also a couple of key differences. No longer under the watchful eye of the all-important transcript, Wayne decides to branch out in his extracurricular activities, he started a band and got into rock climbing. He even pioneered a program teaching underprivileged kids in the community how to climb. And meanwhile, Dave got involved in a bunch of extracurriculars that he had never been involved with before, stuff that he thought might boost his chances of getting into his dream college. And by the end of the semester, Dave was exhausted and Wayne was full of energy. Although Dave did well and kept up his GPA, Wayne got the best grades of his high school career. Freed from having to play it safe, he wrote the papers about topics he genuinely was interested in, rather than the ones he thought the teacher would appreciate, and it showed on the page. Their paths may not have looked very different to an outside eye, but one of these guys was carrying a burden of expectation and one was living life and enjoying it. Because one had known that he was accepted and the other was trying to earn acceptance. And when our life with God, you need to know that you have been accepted by grace. Nothing you did. It was a gift. A gift from God. Rather than something you're trying to win by how good you can be. This is what God did. In verse 8, it says, For it is by grace you've been saved. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Why? What motivated God? God was motivated out of his own character. God's love because of his great love for us. God's mercy, God who is rich in mercy. God's grace. God's kindness. Those were the things that motivated God to be gracious to you and to me. I like the way that um, Max Lucado explains it in a, his book, A, Distant, uh, a Gentle Thunder. 
One of the sweetest reasons God saved you is because he's fond of you. He likes having you around. He thinks you're one of the best things to come down the pike in quite a while. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, your photo would be in it. God loves you. God chooses to be gracious to you and to me because of his mercy, because of his kindness, because of his love. And one, and, and more, and, and even more so, he goes on um, to say that um, God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united in Christ Jesus. He calls us to himself by his grace, and he gives us a purpose in living in that grace that others might see in our lives demonstrated his grace. John Stott wrote this. He said, Toward the end of my time as a theological student at Ridley Hall, Cambridge, the Reverend Paul Gibson retired as principal, and a portrait of him was unveiled. In expressing his thanks, he paid a well-deserved compliment to the artist. He said that in future, he believed people looking at the picture would ask not, who is that man, but rather, who painted that portrait? Now, in our case, God has displayed more than skill. A patient after a major operation as a living testimony to his surgeon's skill, and a condemned man after a reprieve to his sovereign's mercy. We are both exhibits of God's skill and trophies of his grace. Our life, Paul says, is to be one where we are God's masterpiece, verse 10. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do good works. He planned for us long ago. So this morning... You can give up being one of the walking dead by simply believing this amazing truth that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, died for you. That God thinks you're great, something he loves, someone he cares deeply about. That you were worth his son coming into the world to die on the cross in order that you might know him, in order that you might be freed in your living to serve him, to be an example of what grace can do in a person's life. You are saved by grace. So don't do as Paul told the Galatian Christians to be careful not to do, which is to go back to living by some kind of law. But live in the knowledge that God loves you and has given everything by his grace for you. And just remember this little, little word that you can, uh, a little uh, puzzle or uh, acronym that, to help you remember. That grace is God's riches at Christ's expense for you. Lord, thank you for the richness that we have in knowing you as our Lord, as knowing you as our Savior. Thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, to set us free from sin and its consequence, and by giving us a new way to live, by living in the grace that you offer to us. Help us to lay hold of that today and walk in it every day after. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing Amazing Grace.
And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. As you go from this place, go knowing that you are God's masterpiece, that God is doing a work in you. That's a demonstration of what his grace can accomplish in the life of someone entrusted to Jesus. Amen.